What I wanted to do, though, was actually um, exactly as, uh, as the introduction said, is, is um, take us outside of the uh, confines of the United Kingdom for a little while and think about the prospects for global education reform. We've had two or three weeks, uh, inevitably, with an election and the formation of a, uh, a new government, a new coalition government, uh, a lot new happening um, in the United Kingdom where we've been focused on our own uh, country quite rightly. But I want to try and um, uh, leap beyond uh, those borders. And if I can um, start by just asking a question which would apply equally to the children of Aldersbrook, but what about what kind of world uh, will the little girls uh, in this picture from the Punjab grow up into? What kind of world will they live in? What kind of world uh, may they lead uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, or even 40 years from now? Uh, there will, for example, by 2050 be 9 billion people on the planet. When I was born in 1955, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. That is a very crowded planet. And as the world, uh, with all the ups and downs of the world global economics, gets wealthier, uh, those 9 billion people will all want to use the amount of resource uh, that we currently use in Europe, uh, putting huge pressure on the Earth's natural resources. It will be an increasingly urban world. Um, in this country, uh, in 1851 was the year in which we had a majority of the population living in urban areas. Uh, in 1920, America, the United States, passed uh, that milestone. Uh, and in the last decade, the whole planet passed that milestone. So more than half the world's population uh, lives in cities, many of them very large. Uh, Lahore, where these children live, uh, has about six or seven million people. Karachi, uh, not that far away, has 17 million people. So it will be a crowded planet and an increasingly urban planet. It will also be, as we saw from the children at Aldersbrook, uh, but you also see in all the other major cities of the world, an increasingly diverse planet with uh, race, ethnicity, religions, uh, uh, interlinking, overlapping in those large cities. In Toronto, for example, 57% of the population was born not just outside of Toronto, but outside of Canada. That's quite remarkable. In London, 33% of the workforce was born outside of the United Kingdom. So the children at Aldersbrook are growing up in a diverse global city. Uh, so are the children in the picture behind you. We could ask the same questions about these boys from a school nearby. Uh, the world is not only uh, crowded, urban, diverse, it is also deeply unequal in the way it distributes resources. It's fast changing. In 1969, uh, when Neil Armstrong um, stood on the moon for the first time, one of the items he had in his spaceship was a slide rule. Seems bizarre to even think about it now. Uh, it's an increasingly uh, uh, changing world. We, we're all uh, getting used to technology. Uh, the internet is now uh, old history, uh, but once it was new, I don't know how many of you um, uh, took a while to get used to internet shopping. I certainly remember getting a bag of sugar about this large, uh, which I didn't really want and took me a long time to use up. I remember the first time I learnt text messaging from my daughter Alice, uh, who was in uh, Yvonne's school. Um, she was teaching us at home in something like 1995, I guess, uh, how to do text messaging, maybe a bit later. Uh, and um, my wife finally thought she'd got a hang of it, and she said, OK, I know what I'll do. I'll text a message to your older daughter, who at that time was away, at, uh, 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 your older sister, who at that time was away at university. And she typed, I love you, and sent the text message, message from Alice's phone, but mistakenly sent it to a boy uh, at the City of London School for Boys. <laughs> Uh, which resulted in a, fa a fairly tense situation around the kitchen table for a few minutes before my uh, wife, Karen, uh, ended up bringing up this poor 14-year-old boy and saying, Alice doesn't love you and nor do I. <laughs> uh, so technology poses us all kinds of challenges. Um, the, the thing that really represents the development of technology for me was the 11th of May 1997, which was shortly after a previous election, but actually the event that was even more significant in May 1997 was a computer beating Garry Kasparov at chess. To me, that was a big change in the way we think about the world. And now uh, there are a whole lot of new te technologies. I don't know if any of you have seen the people, um, they're, they're going to stop reading books soon, soon because you see people, these Kindles and all the other things uh, that, that, that are allow you to download entire 
books. When I became a member of the Governing Council here at the Institute, um, having been a professor here, one of the things I like best about the Institute is the library. We had a briefing as members of the Governing Council about the library. It was absolutely fantastic. It's amazing what they can do. The briefing lasted 20 minutes, and the librarian, who's a wonderful man, didn't mention books once. The other thing about the world uh, is because of the pressure on its resources, uh, we know it's going to get warmer and we know that climate change is going to be a challenge. If you look back over um, uh, recent centuries, you get a, uh, some fluctuations in the variation in the planet's temperature, but a two degree Celsius rise in a century is completely unprecedented. And that's what it'll be if the Copenhagen Agreement were fully implemented really effectively right around the world. So when you look at these children, all the children of Alders, Aldersbrook, all the children that many of you see, or the grandchildren of the people uh, here mentioned on the panel, we're preparing them for an extremely challenging world. And one of the things that uh, to me seems to be important is that education reform needs to keep up with the challenges that our children are going to face. And there are some really, uh, I think, very encouraging developments in uh, the understanding of education reform in the last uh, probably only 10 years, and I want to spend uh, my time talking about those. Many of you uh, in the room will be familiar with the work done in the 1980s on uh, what makes an effective school. Much of it was done here in this institute by uh, uh, esteemed uh, colleagues such as uh, Professor Peter Mortimer, Louise Stoll, Pam Sammons and others, but also done in other universities across the United Kingdom, in Australia, uh, in Hong Kong uh, and in the United States. Very important word, work. And by the end of the 1980s, it was pretty clear from multi-level modelling and really good statistical techniques what were the characteristics of effective schools. And uh, some of you probably even read the lists of 9, 10, or 11 characteristics that defined an effective school. And then people said, well, that is very interesting, and it's very important. A lot of it tells us what we thought we already knew, but nevertheless, it's important to have it evidence-based and uh, really seen through and uh, increasingly international. But then people said, well, it's one thing to be able to define an effective school when you find it, but the really important challenge for a head teacher or a principal in the United States, or indeed for a policymaker, is not what does an effective school look like, but how do you become effective? And so in the 1990s, the research moved on, and a lot of it was about school improvement. How do you take a school that is quite good and make it brilliant? How do you take a school that is struggling and make it good? And we had a lot of very good, uh, profound research, again, much of it done here in the Institute, but also all around the world, on school improvement. What's happening in, in the most recent decade or two is people are taking a similar approach but looking at whole systems. So in the last decade, um, we began to get much clearer about what a good education system, a whole system, whether a state of the United States or um, a province of Canada or uh, England or France or whatever it might be. So large systems, we began to understand what were the characteristics of effective school systems. And now, just as happened with schools in the 1990s, people are beginning to say, well, it's one thing to be able to tell us what an effective system looks like. But the really important question for a policy challenge is how do you make a system, how do you enable a system to become effective? And for the children in the picture, this is a really important question, and it's a really urgent question.